hi guys to the group. I'm your Associate Dean, Dr. Sarah Stewart Spencer. Um, I'm super excited to have you guys here. Um, and I'm personally really just excited to hear the discussion today. So Dr. Mark Young is gonna speak with us today. You guys obviously recognize the name, especially if you're in our skills class, our practicum class. We have his book throughout uh, where we talk about um, the art of learning and helping. And so I just really wanna um, go ahead and hand over uh, the mic so that he can jump right in. Good, I'm glad everybody's already, that book kind of stands out right there. Um, so that he can jump in and we can get the most we can out of this discussion. Um, I will say go ahead and add comments to the chat box or the questions and answers. I'm gonna open a poll here shortly. Feel free to, um, to participate in it and then you can minimize it and we'll talk about the results a little bit later today. So super excited to welcome Dr. Mark Young. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me and I'm gonna share my screen now, which is a uh, PowerPoint and uh, it sort of gives the title of the talk, but it doesn't cover quite everything. Uh, besides talking about the relationship, I'm going to talk about other factors that are helpful or harmful in being an effective counselor. Now, uh, I called it, it's a relationship stupid, and I'm not calling anyone stupid. I'm talking about something that happened in 1992 when Bill Clinton was running for president. And at that time, he... Um, he uh, made people write on the whiteboard outside the office every day. It's the, it's the economy, stupid, to remind everyone that that's what they needed, the major message. But why do we need this message? It's the relationship. Uh, why do we need to be reminded on a regular basis? It's because uh, we forget. One of the things that happens to you when you go through training as a counselor is you get rid of all the bad things that you do. People tell you, don't do this, don't do that. And pretty soon, uh, you're not doing a lot of the things that are helpful because you're afraid to do the, some things. And well, some things need to be eliminated. Uh, there was something about you when you be, decided to become a counselor, counseling psychologist, that uh, people saw in you. And so if you'll take a look at the poll, which is coming up here, I think. Uh, uh, there are two, actually two polls here. And if you could take a look at the second one, it says, before I entered this program, people said I was one of these things. And uh, so if you could uh, just weigh in on that, it'll give us something to talk about. You know, um, Arnold Lazarus was a famous therapist at Rutgers, and he wrote an interesting article, which is called, Will, I, Will We Ever Transcend the Shackles of Our Training? And in this article, he talked about a friend he knew who was a dentist. And the dentist was effective as a dentist because he had good listening skills, and he was just naturally therapeutic. He was not judgmental and so on. And then he went into training to become a therapist after he had spent some time as a client himself. And according to Arnold Lazarus, he went through a period where he was just kind of full of buzzwords and psychobabble. Oh, so people have to, it looks like people have to um, fill out both the polls before they can be submitted. That's okay. It, I'm seeing on my end, as long as you guys click your option, it does register it. Um, but if it's not letting you submit, you're welcome to fill out both and then we'll use this for discussion. Okay, good. All right, so, so what he was pointing out is that sometimes training can get rid of not just the bad things that we do, but also all the good things that we do. So I'm hoping that you'll think about as, as you go through your training, that the thing that got you here in the first place 
that you'll be able to hold on to and not let them train, <laughs> train it out of you. Because uh, what happens when you're a, in a counseling session is, to quote Frank Herbert uh, in Dune, fear is the mind killer. So as we become anxious, we start to focus on ourselves and forget about all those natural qualities that we have. So if we take a look at the poll so far, what I'm seeing is that just about every one of these, uh, but probably a good listener was number one. Wow, we have 197 possible participants. Wow. So what I'm hoping you'll do is take a look at your own results and think about how you can retain that as you go through training. Why is this important? Because it's the relationships that we've got to maintain. And it's those relationships that got you here in the first place. So. Wow. All right, so I'm gonna proceed with my uh, PowerPoint here. And if Dr. Stuart Spencer sees any useful or important con comments or something that we ought to stop for right now, uh, uh, we can do that. You got it, that sounds like a plan. All right, so trying to remember what got you here at this point, what, got, what did you do so far? <laughs> that made it and people feel that you could be a therapist. How do you retain that and keep it when you have to enter a real relationship? So I mentioned Bill Clinton's whoops, notion of the, in the campaign, but let, if we're really interested in science and research, which most counselors are not, but uh, the relationship accounts for for change more than any single technique or theory. And this is something we have to keep in mind. Why? Because there's always the shiny new thing coming down the pike. And if you go to a conference, the first thing you wanna do is collect another technique to add to your armamentarium as a counselor. However, uh, that's not gonna be as much helpful. It's like only half as helpful as being able to go back and form a very basic relationship. And uh, this, so this is the message you're getting from science. Pay attention to the relationship, but why don't we listen to research? Uh, I think that the, um, that the research says that only half the medication prescribed in the country is ever taken. So 50% of the time when the doctor prescribes something, we don't do it. The same thing is true when a therapist gives advice to a client, half the time they don't do it. So we have to keep in mind that um, this is the advice that we're being given by the experts that we should pay attention to the relationship. And so when we look at the change methods, the things that uh, account for outcome, for positive outcome, the theory and techniques that we use, whether it's EMDR or cognitive behavior therapy, only account for about half of what the relationship accounts for. Individual therapists also, uh, uh, so some therapists are better than others. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then there are client characteristics, which account for a huge percentage. But there's a lot of what causes change in psychotherapy that we don't know about. And uh, so that is uh, still uh, fodder for further research. So I'm gonna talk about each of these, so. First of all, let's talk about the dodo bird. The dodo bird in Alice in Wonderland, um, the queen, it's called the dodo bird verdict because the queen of hearts says in Alice in Wonderland, all have won and all must receive prizes. And although the dodo bird is actually extinct, the idea is that every psychotherapy has been found to be equally effective. In other words, there have been no times when 
Well, there have been studies where one therapy technique was better than others, but you know, we've known for 65 years that when Rosenzweig wrote his foundational article that that when we compare different therapies head to head, nothing really comes out of them, uh, showing that one therapy works better than another. Now, some studies have shown that cognitive behavior therapy, for example, works for for something better than, but when Recently, the uh, other people have looked at those studies and found that that really isn't so. It's because of the size of the study and they overwhelmed the statistical research anyway. Um, so it's really the similarities among the models that account for most of the change that clients can experience. It is not some specific thing that cognitive behavior therapy has that none of the others have. So it tells us something about what we ought to be training people. We ought to be training them in the big things and not worry about techniques so much. But techniques are so interesting. I mean, I wrote a book on techniques because I love techniques, but we can't forget the primacy of the therapeutic relationship. So in the, um, excuse me. So let's talk about therapist factors for a moment because therapist factors influence the outcome. There's a small group of clinicians, sometimes called super shrinks, who obtain demonstrably superior results while others fall short uh, on the bell-shaped curve. So most clinicians do well, and 80% of clients who get therapy do better than, than those who do not, Still, there are clinicians who are better than others and they can influence uh, outcome. So we'll talk later about how, how you can uh, become a better therapist. But, but then we also mentioned client factors because whether a client is defensive or not really makes a difference. Uh, I don't know, early on in the in my work as a therapist, uh, I found that people expected me to, when I was referred a client who was just out of prison or in a halfway house or uh, completely unmotivated for therapy, they expected that I would be able to do something about that. And there are some things we could do to test people's ability to, to be, uh, um, available for therapy, but at some point, we have to try and bring them into the relationship. And, and then at the same time, we have to assess their readiness. Some clients don't get involved in therapy because they're not ready. And that's where stages of change take place. And I found this out when I was working in a college counseling center. And, and at that time, we would have a client, for example, who, uh, was referred for alcohol use. And college students who are referred for alcohol abuse are not ready to go into a treatment facility for 90, 30, 60, 90 days. Instead, they will watch a video about alcohol use or they will read a pamphlet about alcohol use. So understanding the client's stage of change, their readiness, their, they're in pre-contemplation, so we have to educate them. So understanding client readiness uh, clients who are not ready for our treatment, uh, that's one reason they drop out. Some clients ha have had attachment experiences with their own parents and other people in authority are, to such an extent that they're not open to a therapeutic relationship. All of these play a role in whether or not people get better in therapy. And, you know, the coping style, are they, um, are they uh, internally focused or are they externally focused? For example, um, are they internal processes or external processes? Probably, you know, both people have, uh, these differences can be relied on to, uh, to affect the relationship with the therapist, but the therapist needs to adapt to the client. And for someone who's an external processor, they need to let them talk, for example. So, 
So my first suggestion for you is, uh, and this is what John Norcross said to me, he said, stop doing what doesn't work. Uh, he said it in a much more profane way, but uh, this is the suggestion, stop doing what doesn't work and start doing what does work. So well, t let's talk about um, what we shouldn't be doing. And one of them is discredited treatments. We shouldn't be using treatments that most people think just are a hoax. And these are a number of the ones that Norcross mentioned uh, from, and of course the most discredited was angel therapy, but there's a few on here that are quite common. For, let's take thought field therapy, for example. This is the tapping thing. I don't know if you've heard about this, but uh, this is Callahan's tapping thing. And um, there's absolutely no, so there's a bunch of articles about it. There's absolutely no scientific evidence that tapping works. Now it might work. Uh, and there are a lot of these things that have never really been studied. How are you going to study past lives therapy? But so there are promising treatments that haven't been studied. And then there are just flat out things that are not going to work, like primal screen therapy. Most people haven't heard of this, but the book is uh, by Janoff uh, in the 1970s. And the primal screen therapy, people would put themselves in a box and scream a lot. It was a cathartic kind of experience. So we know that these things, even when they have been studied, don't show any uh, effect. Aromatherapy. Uh, now, maybe some of these are your favorite, and I am sorry I'm stepping on these, but um, uh, there's one that particular, the Earhart seminar training called EST. It turned in, when it became controversial and illegal, they changed the name to Landmark. And then they changed it now to Gratitude Incorporated. Now, many people go to these uh, revivals is kind of what they are, group therapy sessions, but there's a lot of control exerted and there's definitely been some harmful things that have happened. But moreover, there's no uh, evidence that they've, they're really helpful. So this is the first thing you shouldn't do. Don't use discredited treatment. The second thing that's been a failure is matching therapist and client. Now, first of all, it's impractical. I've never worked at a place where I got to choose all the clients that I saw, nor was I able to, um, to give clients to somebody based on some sort of match. But also the matching process doesn't seem to work. Uh, matching in terms of ethnicity or gender and so on, it's all very difficult because what the client considers a match and what we consider a match might be uh, something totally different. So this, this has been a failure. That this is what doesn't work. Uh, and now I'm gonna really make somebody mad by saying that CBT for everything does not work. Now here's the story on CBT. It's not the most effective treatment. And in uh, 2012, Sweden adopted CBT as the only treatment for anxiety and depression in the whole country. This is what you can do when you have a national health system. You can keep data on all the people who, and you can require every therapist to utilize, if they want to get paid, uh, CBT. So this is what they did. And 9 billion crowns is what they spent. It's, a crown sounds like a lot of money. I'm not sure how much it actually is. But they spent 9 billion down, crowns teaching people, uh, CBT, all the therapists in the country had to learn CBT to treat anxiety and depression. And the widespread adoption of this CBT method had absolutely no effect on the outcome of people who were disabled by depression and anxiety. And a significant number of people who were not disabled at the time they were treated with CBT became disabled, uh, thereby increasing the amount of time they spent on disability and nearly a quarter of the people were, uh, treated with CBT dropped out. So the conclusion of the Swedish people was that steering, pe steering therapists towards a specific treatment has been ineffective in achieving the objective of better outcomes for clients. So it turns out that what's really best for clients is probably whatever the therapist feels they're good at and they're already doing. It did not improve 
on what therapists were already doing in therapy. A similar study in England has showed uh, the same kind of results. The reason that CBT has been so promoted is that they've done a lot more research than other people. But when it comes to head-to-head -head comparisons, there still is not evidence suggesting it's, it's the thing for it. And you know, this is what happens when a new therapy comes out too, like let's say EMDR. Or before many of you were born, there was the one called Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP. NLP was going to treat schizophrenia and all sorts of other psychological problems. Everything would be better, but nobody's even heard of it now. So uh, CBT will remain as a therapy, but we can't be fooled by its press. Another thing that people think is going to help us is more experience. As we get more experience, we should be a better therapist. And what happens actually is that uh, there's actually no improvement over time through experience. Instead, in some cases, people get worse. Here's my idea about one of the, the reasons, and that is that when you go into practicum or you go into an internship situation where you have a different supervisor than your college professor, uh, many people start to believe that, oh, well, there's the real world and then there's the world of academia where they're all in, a, in an ivory tower and they don't really know what's happening out there. I should really listen to my supervisor. And so they start thinking that they're, whatever their supervisor says is right. Unfortunately, uh, Training and education are different. Education means you learn what you should do and training is what we're already doing out there. So uh, your experience is definitely uh, an important aspect if you learn from it. But when people get out into practice, they're practicing by themselves. They're not practicing on video and they're not being observed by others 99% of the time. Thus, uh, no one sees your work, you never get any feedback. And so you get start to get sloppy. You know, it's just like when you do a research project and we ask graders to rate people on a particular characteristic. Over time, the raters start to deteriorate and we have to retrain them. The same thing happens with therapists in practice. Performance goes down over time because we forget about the basics. So here's something about supervision. A little John Dewey thing. We don't learn from experience, uh, from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. So this is why I always <clears throat> talk a lot about the reflective practitioner. So you should be reflecting on not just your successes, but also your failures and thinking about what you can learn from this experience rather than simply going in and getting support. We don't need a supportive relationship in therapy. We need self-criticism. We need feedback from our supervisor. And those are the things that are predictors of the therapeutic alliance and also in terms of better outcomes for, for clients. So you can see this little uh, graphic, I hope, in the right-hand side. It looks like the top one is darker. But if you're able to take the background out of this, they're actually the same color. This is not an optical illusion, but it's a result of learning. When we, we learn that shadows uh, are, we see shadows as a different color because, like when we're going down the steps, this is helpful and we re our brain has learned to adapt to these changes in lighting to, uh, so that we can navigate. So this previous learning is what affects us in our, in our uh, looking at any kind of client problem. We, you know, I got sober this way in, in, uh, as an alcoholic and therefore everybody else should get sober this way. It's doubt and self-examination, self-criticism that we need in order to get away from these uh, preconceived notions that we have.
Now, you can see that uh, this picture, by the way, is Sigmund Freud's office. That's where I am right now. It's actually, the office in London, uh, just a sidelight here. I actually took a group of students to Vienna, hoping to see the couch, and uh, turned out it was London. But never mind that. So what about counseling for the counselor? Is that gonna be helpful? It turns out the counselors like it and feel it's one of the most important experiences next to supervision that they have in growth as a therapist. However, it's not connected to outcome for clients. So a lot of things like supervision don't necessarily help the client, they help the counselor. So if we wanna help clients, we need to do what works. And how do we determine what works? What are we gonna, what kind of techniques are we gonna use? Uh, well, you know, of course we wanna try and use evidence-based techniques if we can, but there are also practice-based evidence when something works in practice and we can record that. So there's that kind of evidence as well. Also, we need to use promising practices even if there's not a huge body of research, but we should use things that, uh, that uh, are definitely discredited and we know don't work. And we can't expect also that because it's a new thing that it's gonna be more effective than the old thing. Here's one of the things that we know works and this is uh, the real relationship. It's being genuine in the counseling setting. Being real with the client enhances the relationship. And this may look kind of unprofessional sometimes. Uh, so I'm going to try and show you a video now of uh, one of my colleagues. You know, I went through my own videos to see where I was being a real person. And I realized that when I'm on video, I'm trying to be the perfect counselor. I'm trying to demonstrate this skill. I'm not really trying to be myself. And I think that's a little bit of a detriment in the videos. Uh, because what do people want when they see a counselor? They want they want to connect with them. They want to see a real person. They don't necessarily want a monolith. They don't want a, an icon. They're looking for a real relationship. So I thought I'd show you just about five minutes of my colleague, Kent Butler, uh, work, working with the client. Now he has something I don't have for sure, and I envy, and that is he has personal warmth. This is a powerful interpersonal uh, a characteristic that, uh, if you have it, uh, I think Dr. Stuart Spencer has warmth. Uh, if you have it, it's a powerful thing in psychotherapy. Uh, if you don't, you have to compensate for it in other ways, as I do, by being smart and mysterious. But anyway, I'm going to show you Dr. Butler now, and uh, I'm going to uh, stop my previous share and. Uh, share a different screen now. So when you were counseling, mm -hmm. how do you see yourself being able to do that? I'm not sure. <laughs> so you Okay, let me just say this. The client is a dancer, professional dancer, and she's just trying to decide whether or not she wants to be a counselor or not. And, she, and Dr. Butler has suggested that she, uh, she try to merge these two. And he does a lot of things in this video I would never do, but is he effective in showing himself? I think he is, and that's what I'm hoping you'll look for. Skills you've gotten as a, as a dancer, mm -hmm. do you see yourself maybe being a dance therapist or a dance counselor therapist? Mm -hmm. I don't know if even a, a, a thought that, that could even happen, yeah. but is there something that you can see incorporating those skills that you have as a dancer right. into what might become you as a counselor? Yes, um, I've looked into movement therapy a lot okay. and I, I'm really drawn to it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, the part of dance that I love so much was the performing. Okay. And so it, it's a different thing. And so I think it's switching into that mindset of, 
because I guess the way I see performing is kind of a selfish thing. It's something that I enjoy doing and I don't care so much about how others perceive it. Right. But then when it comes to like movement therapy, it's it's more for the, right. the client, for the individual you're helping. Right. So it's no longer about like how you're expressing things, it's putting the focus on somebody else. So it seems like you're experiencing a loss then. Yes. Because most athletes even, when they're at the end of their career, as a pro football player or a basketball player or a soccer player or mm -hmm. something like that, they get to the end of their career and then it's like, oh my God, what do I do now? Right. There's a, this lost space and so it sounds like I'm looking at you, maybe that turmoil that's going on, even though it's calm, is really understanding that I'm losing something or I may be losing something that mm -hmm. I'll never be able to go back to. Right. It, it kind of feels like losing a part of myself just because I've put so much focus on it and I added an extra year under undergrad just so that I could pursue dance. And I had so many people telling me that, you know, that I would do really well with it, that I should go to New York and be a professional dancer. And and now it's kind of coming to the point where I can see the disappointment in people that I ha didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And rather, even though I'm doing something that's going to be helping others, they don't see that. They see more that I missed out on an opportunity. Okay. So it makes me feel like I didn't. Okay. So let's so, focus in on how you feel and not what others feel mm -hmm. about what you should be doing. In this time, in this space, what do you want to be doing? I wish I could do both. <laughs> I wish I could be a professional dancer that did counseling as a full-time job, but I know that's not very realistic. <laughs> Tell me how come that's not realistic? Just the, the demands of both careers, because as a professional dancer, you'd be doing a lot of traveling, okay. and you'd have rehearsals all throughout the week, and, and I know a lot of professional dancers have like part-time jobs. Okay. But if, I mean, just to go through the process of becoming a counselor, you need to be going to school. And I just don't know how those would, the scheduling wise, how those would work okay. with each other. All right. And still, while you're sitting thinking about this, I want you to kind of think about how you can kind of meld those two pieces mm -hmm. together. And maybe the performance piece may not be as strong as if you were on the stage, but maybe there's something that you can take from those performance pieces and bring to your counseling experiences. Uh, do you think that um, when you look back at your life, and, you, and if I can kind of recap some of that, mm -hmm. it's like you've been a dancer, you've known dance most of your life, something in you has told you that being a counselor and helping others is also a part of who you have mm -hmm. become. And so as you're moving forward, now there's a disconnect, there's this the service that's being done right. and that now I have to leave this and it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is that you have to leave it and leave it totally that it's either dance and performance and on the stage and yeah. traveling or it's counseling right and so there's no in between for you and don't know where to find that in between okay. and I kind of looked into dance classes and there's not a whole lot of I really like modern dance. That's my favorite, and okay. it's where I felt the most most comfortable. And there's not a lot of opportunity okay. for modern dance in Orlando, and so it's it's been difficult. I've done research, and like the couple places I found, they don't have the technique or the credentials that I'm looking for, okay. and so it's I would have to leave to really find what it was that I what I need from dance, and so I don't know how to find that and get that when it's not available. Right. And now I'm seeing a different you. I'm seeing a lot of energy coming out of you right now because <laughs> yeah. you're really excited about really trying to be uh, a, a person who can kind of navigate what's happening in Orlando here with who you are and who you see yourself to be. Right. Okay, uh, before we go any further, does anybody have any uh, thoughts? Maybe we could look at the chat box or the Q&A box here and see if... Um, We've had a couple of yeah. questions come yeah. through around um, kind of going back to that match. Um, mm -hmm. kind of looking at, um, there was two questions. One was more around um, gender, matching with gender. And then another question um, was around the idea of how attachment styles um, change the outcome. So those are the two that have kind of surfaced. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, let's talk about match and gender. It turns out that um, uh, some men would rather have a female therapist. Uh, it's not just a, 
the strictly, uh, I want a male therapist because I'm a male. So we can't tell in advance unless uh, we talk to the client. The question is, is it important to the client? Like gender is important if it's important to the client. It's not important as a rule. And ethnicity is not important unless it's important to the client. So do I want somebody from my own ethnic background? Does that help? It doesn't help <laughs> if we make the match. In fact, we have research evidence to suggest that if I match all the uh, Spanish speaking people with Spanish speaking counselors, I'm gonna get a better outcome. It doesn't work that way. It's only if it's important to the client. And in many cases it is. So that's, the other question was about attachment or? Attach, the client's attachment style and impact on outcome. Yeah. Uh, there, is, there is an impact on outcome uh, because uh, clients with, uh, an, a, with an inability to form secure attachments with people have difficulty entering the therapeutic relationship. So they're missing all that all the power of the therapeutic relationship in, in, in helping to improve their, their outcomes. They're, they will still, they can still benefit, but maybe they have to address that issue of the relationship a lot more in psychotherapy than they want to. I mean, this is why Freud talked a lot about transference, counter-transference, because he felt that the relationship was uh, critical to how people were able to enter the relationship and stay in the relationship. Another question is around the video. You had mentioned that there are a few things that yeah. uh, you wouldn't have done. And I'm, I have a feeling you're probably going to address that now that we're done with the video. <laughs> but a question came up around, um, you know, when you say that you wouldn't have done some of the things, what could you highlight there? Uh, well, really, he, he pushed his own, he pushed his own idea that, uh, uh, that she should try and meld the two things. And she backed away from that. So he backed away from it. So I thought that was good. I'm not sure I would have ever been that direct in terms of, of trying to help her. But I did like the fact that he sort of pointed out her black and white thinking. That I did think was important. You know, so in your mind, you know, it's either this, it's either dancing or counseling. And that would have been a better way for me than to say, can you think about ways in which you can meld the two things together? So, um, uh, but overall, as I watch this for the tenth time, maybe I, I think I, I, I see a, a more positives than I did the first time, because his style is so different from mine. I think, but I'm wondering what people saw. Uh, if I can find the text chat box here, um, the uh, in. Uh, in him that they that indicated that he was more real he was real in the relationship Let's see if anybody you guys are welcome to use the chat box and highlight your response yeah he talked about football yeah and he, you know, he smiled and a lot of warmth came from his face too. I, uh, the tone of his speech, some people mentioned, he really was picking up on her and he picked up on the change in her empathy. Now that is a characteristic of a good therapist, I think, that they see the, uh, uh, they see the changes in people's emotions and are able to spot that. Yeah, he was picking up on her love. So, Love for dance. Yeah, his facial expression, some people mention. And he took her seriously. He didn't say, oh, well, you know, he didn't downplay dancing as a, as a career. Uh, he also pointed out that uh, she was looking to other people rather than himself. See, I might not have said it quite the way that he did. Uh, he said, basically, well, let's not be concerned about other people. I might have just reflected, you know, it just sounds like you're very concerned about what other people think about your career. All right. 
I don't see any real questions here, but yeah, I think we're all about, he did, he did approach it with humor and, and modesty. Like, you know, he was interested. He didn't seem like he had all the answers. So I did like that. Okay. All right. So that's the, that's one thing that can help us. And that is being real with the client. And I think he shows it much better than I do. <laughs> I'm very formal in my, in the videos that I do. He was direct, someone said, and yeah. All right, so let's go on to the next thing. And here's the thing we we mentioned before that people, when they are go into their practicum internship, they forget the basic skills and they get attracted to the shiny new thing that's out there, something that the therapist wants, that their supervisor likes, or but here are the things that really work. Here, and this psychotherapy trainee is saying. Uh, uh, the supervisor saying, oh, okay, nod a little slower this time. Then let's work on saying, mm-hmm, go on, you try it. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's supposed to be funny, but at the same time, that's what we really need to be doing. We really need to go back and practice the basics, that the things that enhance the relationship and stop worrying about trying to change the client. They've gotten themselves into this situation over a period of time. We're not going to solve it in five minutes with EMDR. So we've got to uh, go back to these basic skills because that's what works. You know, Pablo Casals, the famous celloist, practiced three to four hours a day when he was 80 years old. And they asked him why. He said, you know, I think I'm getting better. So he was trying to point out that even when you're highly skilled, you have to go back and practice over and over again what got you there in the first place, what really works. I think we saw in the video the second thing, whoops, which was warmth. And if you have warmth, or if you can try and convey warmth, as I mentioned, I don't have it, but I try to convey warmth by smiling and by my sense of interest and so on. Uh, so that is an important thing for clients. Empathy, obviously, trying to empathize as Dr. Butler did with this client. He was empathizing with her by reflecting and trying to really understand her situation. Another thing that, that works is myths and rituals. Now there's a, this is what Jerome Frank talked a lot about in his book, Persuasion and Healing, which is considered to be a classic in the field. The last version was 1990, 1991. He was at Johns Hopkins. And he really felt that we need to explain to clients why they get better. So let's say you're a psychodynamic therapist. You've got to explain to the client how they're going to get better. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to come in for the next two years and you're going to twice a week and you're going to lie on the couch like this one behind me. And you're going to say the first thing that comes to your mind, that's free association. You're going to, and one day, it's all going to make sense to you. You're going to have a catharsis and you're going to have an emotional ab reaction and you're going to be cured. That's how we do it in traditional Freudian psychotherapy. That is a myth. And he explains the ritual that goes along with it. Telling clients this is part of the battle of enhancing the relationship and getting the client to engage in therapy because we've told them how they're going to get better and they understand the process. So explaining the process of psychotherapy to the client, whatever you conceive it to be, is really important. These are the things that work in psychotherapy, using the basic skills, being warm, being empathic, and explaining things to the client. And here's one that's very close to my heart, I guess, uh, because it took me a lot of years to understand this. Now, Carl Rogers would not agree with this, but the research tells us something different. That is that we need to identify a goal with our clients and collaborate with them. So goal consensus, that means we both agree on it, and collaboration works. And a structured therapy is better than an unstructured therapy. If we compare the two, Structure, wherever there's structure, it's better. I'm suddenly reminded of the fact that in my early days, I was practicing CBT and 
uh, my client got a lot better. And at the end of the therapy, I said to him, well, um, what do you think worked? And he said, well, you know, I think it was really the relationship. And I said, but what about all those CBT forms I asked you to fill out about when emotions occurred and what thoughts you had and stuff? He said, well, to tell you the truth, I had my wife fill out all those forms because, um, you know, I really didn't want to be bothered with it and I didn't want to hurt your feelings. So whenever you have a goal with the client and you, you're working together and it enhances the relationship and the relationship again is the thing that really works. Now, another thing we talked about client factors before and knowing your client is, is crucial. And when I'm training students in the clinic, I, I always tell them, you need to know what brand of chewing gum your client chews, you know, because a small, understandings of the client's real life can really help you because you could then you can be a chameleon and change to adapt to the client that's part of our job if the client says i don't like that you say oh okay well how about this uh so we're constantly trying to adapt to the what the client sees as important to keep the relationship going but client factors make a difference and here's some client factors that make a difference. Client therapy expectations. Uh, all right, so client therapy expectations. Uh, there was a guy named Gil who wrote an article and in this article he suggested play, that he would put a uh, confederate in the waiting room and when new clients came in, the confederate would say things like, wow, this therapist is incredible. You know, I was in a terrible, terrible straits until I came here. Everybody says like she's the best therapist ever. So uh, increasing hope maybe doesn't have to ha go that far, but increasing, that's why we put our plaques on the wall and our degrees and so on. And we show clients that we try to increase their expectations. And if clients have low expectations of therapy, their outcomes are worse. We talked about readiness before. Are they, is the client ready? Are they willing and able? Those factors are crucial in determining whether a client will get anything out of therapy or not. And we can help them by thinking about stages of change, testing their willingness. And, and one of the things that we do in, when a client is unwilling to be in therapy is we tell them that they don't have to come to therapy. This is a choice that they can make. Uh, right now, I'm finishing up the third edition of my couples book, and we're really, you know, this is a big problem in couples therapy because how do you uh, help someone when one member of the couple doesn't even want to come into therapy? And we call them up and say, you know what, we're going to be talking about you in therapy, and just thought you might want to show up. And um, I see people are raising hands, so let me stop here um, before yeah. we go and see if there are any things that we ought to talk about. We have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just gonna kind of scroll through a few of these. Um, so you've mentioned EMDR a few times. And yeah. so people are interested in, do you use it? Um, and do you feel like it has evidence to be used? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, EMDR works. There's no question about it. Does it work better than anything else? No. It works about one session faster than traditional exposure therapy. Exposure therapy is when you expose people to a uh, stimulus that makes them anxious, you know. Uh, like when we treat phobias, we show people a picture of a spider and then we slowly, slowly move them. That's exposure therapy, right? Until they're actually exposed to an actual spider. So John Norcross feels that that EMDR is just exposure therapy that works a little faster. One reason it might work faster is it's novel, it's different, it's new. But uh, is it a superior treatment? No, it's, it's not superior to traditional behavior therapies that, that help people uh, previously. So, uh, and in terms of uh, the reprocessing part of it, I mean, part of the theory is that you're reprocessing. We don't know that. That's just hypothetical, that's theoretical. Uh, yet they, they talk about it as if it's a fact. Uh, uh, 
So there's no problem with using EMDR, but again, we have to be, we have to recognize that there are some things that work in psychotherapy, in all psychotherapies, new learning experiences like that, exposure, it's, it's nothing new. There's very little new under the sun, you know, it's, it's old wine and new skins. Um, another question that we have is mm -hmm. you on self-disclosure and warmth um, mm -hmm. and empathy. Do, does it increase? Does self-disclosure increase those? Uh, I, yes, self-disclosure self does help. You know, I think in Dr. Butler's video, you saw he didn't really self-disclose, but he talked a little bit about football, suggesting he knew something about professional athletes, but he didn't really self-disclose. He was more trying to be warm and empathic with the client. And I think that's what worked there. But, you know, it can go both ways, of course. And we talk about this in Learning the Art of Helping, that self-disclosure can be bad, too, if it doesn't match what the client is thinking, uh, if it doesn't match their experience. When a client has a horrible experience, you know, when, you're, when you have a family member that dies uh, and you're mourning, and somebody else says, you know, I know exactly what you're going through because I went through that with my parents. Sometimes that's helpful, but sometimes it's like, well, no, you don't because, you know, she went through a horrible death and we had such a conflicted relationship and so on. So uh, self-disclosure can is definitely a positive when it's done in the right way, but it can also cut, it's a sword that can cut both ways. Um, another question is around the idea of the, I don't know how to say this, like a super shrinks, like those yeah. that are masters, what's something, one of those common characteristics that we see that might be different from an everyday counselor? One is that they're not, they're very direct and they go right for the, they go right for the center of the problem. They, they are not afraid to touch what hurts. You know, does this hurt? And they poke it. Uh, so they're very direct. That's one of the characteristics of, you know, I went out to lunch one time with a famous therapist who was giving a speech and, uh, and they served him a des des dessert and he did not slowly take little pieces. He went, he like stabbed it and went right after the center of the creamy center of the dessert. And I thought, you know, this is just like what he does in therapy. Uh, he, you know, they go directly to where it hurts because they are hypersensitive to emotions in clients and they can read them. So reading people, there's a book by Ernst Baer called People Reading where he talks about this. And in fact, Ernst Baer's book, The Silent Language of Psychotherapy, is really about recognizing the messages that clients send and what they're really intending. So uh, yeah, this is being direct and also being able to read the emotions of clients. Those are two things that these super shrinks have. Um, so several times today you've referenced different articles and books. I'm wondering if there's a list at the end of your PowerPoint that might, we might be able to offer. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd be glad to provide you with one to send later, but uh, I don't have one. I didn't have, uh, I didn't want to reference it like uh, a textbook. Uh, but many of the articles that I've talked about are in the latest edition of my textbook, which is a, now a seventh edition that just came out. So uh, uh, you don't have to buy my textbook to get the references. So I'd be happy to send them. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Um, okay, so we'll, we can keep going and then... Um, All right, so back. let's uh, let's move on. And uh, these are just some of the characteristic, client characteristics that we talked about. But let's let's focus on doing a poll now that, that second, take a look at that second poll, if we can, about um, if you were my counselor, what would you, uh, what, what do you want from a counselor? And I'm looking... Dr. Young, can you see the results from that um, one? Um, yes, I can, but I, wow. Uh, you know, one of the biggest issues that comes up for people is, um, is uh, directive versus non-directive. But in our, uh, if I'm correct, um, uh, we're seeing 76% of the people saying warmth was very important. 
Uh, do I have the most updated poll? I think so. Yep, you sure do. Yeah, so directive versus non-directive doesn't cover a lot of the character. Really warm and active are the two biggest issues there. So, the, but the question for you is, as an individual, looking at your own personal results, what is it you're looking for in a therapist? And if um, a therapist needs to know this about you. So for example, John Norcross has done a video and you can, I think you can get it on YouTube or something. And in this video, he asks the client, uh, what relationships in the past have been really effective for you? Like could be a work relationship, a pastor, a therapist, uh, a friend. What was it that you liked about that relationship? And uh, so the client says, you know, uh, the, the relationship I had before the person, my boss gave me a lot of structure in what I was supposed to do. And so I always felt confident in going forward. So now you know something about what the client wants in a relationship and you try to provide it instead of doing whatever it is that you think you ought to do in a therapeutic relationship. You try to adjust and be a chameleon to the client. So thinking about your own personal results, what would you want in a therapist is probably more useful than looking at what most people want. However, see how important warmth is. Somehow the relationship, it's not how smart they are probably, it's, it's whether or not you know, they have the ability to form a warm relationship with you. So if you're gonna put your money into something, it would be try to focus on the relationship. Uh, the warmth in the relationship, the naturalness, the genuineness, and the uh, real relationship. Not very many people want to form a relationship with a therapist. Although some people do. They don't want the therapist to be too invasive. So you have to know this about your client if you want to provide them with what's going to be helpful to them. Any other thoughts on that? You know, I'm looking at questions and answers. And uh, Kareen writes, does the relationship supervisor supervisee have an impact on the relationship supervisor client supervisee client? Well, that's an interesting question, but basically it doesn't seem to. <laughs> we actually did some research on this and it didn't seem to affect it. Not only that, it doesn't affect client outcome. So if, if you have a good relationship with your supervisor, it doesn't mean that the client's gonna be doing any better. It helps you as a therapist, but it doesn't seem to help the client. Uh, so another question that Nicole said, and that was eight minutes ago, but what do you say to a client if you find they're not ready and how do you move them towards readiness? Well, I think this is where stages of change can come in uh, if you if you can read about stages of change, North Cross, uh, Prochaska, and De Clementi have, have written a lot about this. Identifying the client's level of change and only providing them with whatever change they're ready for, rather than trying to move them into an extreme treatment situation. Some clients are not ready for a weekly therapy situation. They want bibliotherapy or some very mild form of treatment because they're not in the contemplation stage. They're not in the, they're not ready to take action. So. Um, Dr. Young, we have a, yeah. only a couple more minutes. Oh boy. So, <laughs> I know our time went by so fast. Um, so uh, uh, do you want to answer a couple more questions or would you like to, is there anything else that you wanted to kind of end on? Yeah, let me just spend a couple of minutes finishing these slides so we have a sense of closure but uh, I can supply the slides to you if you want to distribute them. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Uh, um, I just wanna highlight the notion of ruptures, that when there's a problem in the relationship, the client may not bring it up, but you have to assess for it. And this is what routine outcome monitoring should be looking at as well as, is a client making progress and how is our relationship going? It should be looking at whether or not there was a problem in the relationship. 
And I think you told me or someone told me that that you sometimes use a session rating scale uh, in some of the courses. And this is uh, Scott Miller's thing. And it really asks the client to report every session on how things are going. And when we do that, we find that outcomes increase dramatically. People get better when the counselor is sensitive to times when they didn't feel heard, they feel there was a disruption in the relationship, they didn't work on the problem or any of these other things that can get in the way. The counselor needs to be getting constant feedback from the client. And uh, on the other hand, we also need to find out about the client's symptoms. And this is where instruments like the OQ45, these are the what they call the critical incident items, I mean, critical items on the OQ45, which is a 45 uh, answer, question answer uh, format. It, they can do it online or they can do it on paper pencil. And so every session you ask them about these things. And based on these five critical ins items, we find that uh, we can keep track, track of anything that might be upsetting the client and getting in the way of therapy. And then we can also take a look at uh, this over time. So here's an alert status uh, that comes out from the, and shows that the person started off at 78, but now they're at 104, which means that they are reliably worse and their distress level is moderately high. So you, something is not going well in therapy or else they're under a lot of stress somewhere else. So keeping track of the client's mental status and their relationship uh, what we mean by routine outcome monitoring is something you do every session or in our clinic, we do it every three times during, during 10 sessions. Uh, even that will help. And it doesn't have to be something fancy. This is something I put in an older textbook of mine, but it was based on a, what a, I had a real client do. I asked him to keep a, the average a SUD score, which is self subjective units of discomfort. Every time they had a negative thought, we would track it and see how they were, how intense they were, and then identify the number of negative thoughts, so frequency and intensity. And as you can see, it did go down over time, although there are spikes. So this helps us, uh, these are all the things that therapists can do to track how clients are doing. And when we do that, we vastly improve outcomes. So let's spend whatever time we have left in. Uh, in answering any questions that people might have. Okay, so we have a question um, in the chat about said uh, being a chameleon and then also being authentic. Authentic. How could you do those at the same time? That's a good question. Um, how to be authentic and be a chameleon? I think it's not a you be authentic in both in either situation. But uh, when you're being a chameleon, you're really trying to focus on the client and what the client needs. By, and uh, you can do that in an authentic way. I don't think you have to be phony. Uh, can I think of an example of how that would work? If the client really wants uh, a relationship where, they, uh, where you give them some direction, they, are, they want some directiveness, I think you have to provide that. Uh, for example, uh, one time I was doing Trans, I was doing therapy through tr uh, Chinese translation. And after I was finished talking, the translator uh, kept right on talking after I was, for a long time after I was finished, I said, what, what are you really saying to them? He said, well, I'm giving them a little advice because they tell me that, you know, they don't want to leave today without some kind of advice. And I was being very non-directive. So uh, people do sometimes want that. And I think you have to provide it. All right. Uh, but there are a lot of different ways to do that. For example, you could ask the client to reverse roles, sit in your chair and give themselves advice. So they receive the advice, but you do it in an authentic way. That's a fantastic technique, by the way, that Raymond Corsini often used. Um, so another question is, how do we increase awareness of the individual client expectations towards the therapist? I think that you can 
easily get those in the very first session. Now, have you ever been to therapy before? What are you expecting from therapy? How did you think it would go? What kind of relationship did you imagine that we would have? What kind of relationships have you had in the future that were helpful? And, and, and I need to know a little bit about that. Yeah, you talk about it directly in the very first session. Um, and then another question was, what are the tips that you would specifically suggest to being warm and real? Well, since I'm not very good at it, um, <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you, except that I do know that people really want you to smile at times. But I think it also has to be authentic. One of the, one of the things that I do to show warmth is that I, jo I, I, I tell I, I'm, I'm humorous and uh, that makes me smile and makes me connect with the client. Um, but nonverbals obviously are, are crucial in showing warmth. Uh, leaning forward, trying to paying close attention, all of those things are, are important. Um, so Amy noticed, uh, so in your experience, does court-ordered therapy of any kind work? Mm -hmm. there you go. And uh, my answer to that is, yes, it can work, but you have, to, uh, you have to make sure that the client receives, for example, I've had clients who were convicted of uh, sexually abusing a younger sibling. Do you think we are ever going to be able to address that issue in therapy? I was not successful working with adolescents, like even getting them to talk about it. So we focused on issues that we could talk about and we develop the relationship until they were at that point where they become actually uh, voluntary. Before that point, they're not voluntary. So you can test their voluntariness, but it is unethical, I think, to treat somebody who doesn't want to be treated. So you find a, something that they do want to be, they do want to focus on, you build the relationship and when the trust's there, then you may have a chance to work with them in a voluntary way. What else are you seeing, Dr. Stewart? Um, so the, the, another question was, um, do you adapt your approach for a client who has a strong faith? And if so, how? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if it's important to the client, it's, a, it's important uh, to the therapist. Uh, and if you can't really relate to the client's faith, you can still be empathic and listen and focus and reflect on how important it is. Sometimes clients want uh, a very specific faith. For example, if a client asks me, well, are you a Christian? I'll, I usually say something like this. You know, I'm not a Christian, but I do consider myself to be a spiritual person. And religion and spirituality is very important to me. And if that's something that's important to you, I think we can talk about it. But if you really feel that only a Christian could understand you, then, then I'll be happy to refer you to somebody else. Awesome. I, I think we're probably here at the end of our time. Wow, it went fast. It went fast. It was lovely, though. So um, I, there's still a couple of questions out, but I, since I want to be respectful of everyone's time here, um, so I just want to say a wonderful thank you to Dr. Young for coming and speaking to us, um, to the group. We'll have this on the recording and we'll post it. I've said this in the beginning and I'll say it now. They are working on developing a page for all of our recordings. And then once it's up and running, it'll probably be in the library. And I'll send it out to all of you so you have it as well. Um, let, me, let me say one more thing. Uh, I put my email on the... Uh... There, it's meyoung3000 at gmail, and I encourage you to write to me. Actually, someone named Grant Crossley from Yorkville uh, wrote to me two years ago, and we carried on a conversation <laughs> for a long time about uh, something that was in the textbook, and I changed it based on his feedback. Wow. So, uh, so I do appreciate anything you have to say in your, your point of view, too. Everyone has some truth that I... I'd be, and, I, and I do feel that a two-way communication is definitely more authentic, more defendable in terms of ethical. And so please 
My email again is M E young, M E Y O U N G 3000 at gmail.com. And I put it on the uh, PowerPoint, which I'm going to send to you. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me.